Okay, testing one, two. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Good day, Jerry. Shalom, everyone. Welcome to services on the fourth day of Unleavened Bread. I'd like to start services by asking, uh, well, Mr. Shalesky, would you like to uh, open in prayer? Not to put you on the spot or anything. Okay, so if you all rise, we'll uh, start services by asking Mr. Jerry Shalesky to open in prayer. Jerry? A sound check. Can you hear me well? Heavy Heavenly Father, we have come before you this day seeking thy face and to magnify thee and to honor thee to singing psalms and psalms before thee. This is the fourth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and we observe it and honor thee with obedience. We ask that you hear our prayers and hear the songs and our hymns that we sing give praise to thee, to glorify thee. We thank you for this way of getting together and meeting and observing thy laws and thy commands together and observing this feast together. We thank you for this time and the food that was given to us. We thank you and we ask you to bless this service. And we ask this all in the name of thy beloved son, Yahushua the Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you very much, Jerry. Very appropriate, very fitting opening prayer. If you all remain standing and open your hymnals and turn to page 34, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 44 as our opening hymn, titled, O Yah, We Have Heard. That's O Yah, We Have Heard on page 34. Okay, that was a great start. If you'll turn over now to page 37 of the hymnal, on page 37, we'll sing our second hymn, which comes from Psalm 46, Yah, our strength and refuge is, after which we'll bring uh, Wes to the mic to read in the book of Acts. I believe it is chapters... 22 through 24. 
First, we'll sing 37, Yah, Our Strength and Refuge Is, after which Wes will read in the book of Acts, chapters 22 through 24. Okay, if you'll all be seated, we'll turn the mic over to Mr. West to read in the book of Acts chapters 22 through 24. Wes? Can you hear me now? Dave? Yeah, sounds good. We can hear you, Wes. All right, thank you. Chapter 22. It starts out, let's see. Oh, man, we were at a bad spot. If Paul speaks to the crowd, yeah, that's where we were at. Left us hanging, didn't it? I wanted to hear what he had to say. Brothers and fathers, Listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in, in Aramaic, they came very quiet. Became very quiet, I'm sorry. Then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Taurus of Salia, but brought up in the city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you today. I persecuted followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the councils can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus, and when theirs to being their people as Prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth who you are persecuting. 
he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told all that you ha have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into the Damascus because the brightness of the light had blinded me. A man named uh, Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, Receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous ones and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of, all, of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance. And I saw the Lord speaking. Quickly, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately, because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I am from one synagogue to another, to prisons, and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyred Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Paul, the Roman citizen, verse 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voice and shouted, rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and fiddling, uh, flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to be flogged, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and said, asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I will, but I was born a citizen. Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Got to turn the page. Excuse me. Before the Sanhedrin, the next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priest and all the Sanhedrins to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Chapter 23. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. 
You sit there to judge me according to your to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, you dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sanhedrins and others were Pharisees, called out to the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Philistine, the son of a Philistine. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. There was a great, great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vig vig vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The plot to kill Paul, verse 12. The next morning, the Jews found a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or to drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting to more accurate information about his, his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the sons of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner sent to me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it that you want to tell me? He said, the Jews are agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. Don't give him to, to them because more than, I'm sorry, they have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are re ready now, waiting for you, your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Paul transferred to Caesar. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready and dispatch of, of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearsmen to go to Caesar at night, nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. Claudius, I see it, to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I want you to know why they were accusing him. So I brought him to their, 
their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusations had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I, when I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case, case against him. So the soldiers carried out their orders, took Paul and with them during the night and brought him as far as anti, anti Patris. The next day they left the Calvary, arrived in, in, <clears throat> arrived in Caesar's. They delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from, learning that he was from Cilea, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. The, the trial before Felix. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to uh, Caesar with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. They brought their charges against Paul before the governor. And when Paul was called in, Trulius presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you and your foresight has brought about reforms in the nation everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix. We acknowledge this with profound gratitude, but in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tries to de desecrate the temple. So we seized him, but by examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. For a number of years, you have been a judge over the nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges that they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men. And there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple court doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance, disturbances. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing. I shout 
I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When uh, Lysus, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit him friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Dursilla, who was a Jewish, Judas. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ. As Paul dis discouraged on, discouraged on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When the two years had passed and Felix was succeeded, by uh, Priscilla Festus, but became Felix, wanted to grant a favor to the Jews. He let Paul, left Paul in prison. The end, huh? The trial before Festus. I guess that's where I stop at. Back at you, Dave. Well, thank you, Wes. Appreciate that reading, as always. Um, it's interesting, I think, uh, Paul's use of his Roman citizenship to avoid being killed by the Jews um, and uh, the, uh, the commentary by the centurion, you know, he's, he said that he had to purchase his citizenship at great price because people that were not born Roman citizens could pay to uh, pay for their citizenship. And so apparently that's what he did. But, uh, you know, Paul said, hey, I'm a, I'm a Roman citizen, uh, you know, from Tarsus, no ordinary city. It's a great city. And he, uh, you know, he obviously used his citizenship to uh, avoid being killed. And that's something for us to consider, you know, as we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, citizenship and what it means. Uh, so uh, um, we just need to bear that in mind. Uh, okay, so if you will rise one more time and open your hymnals to page 41, We'll sing our third hymn, which comes from Psalm 51, titled, In Thy Loving Kindness, Yah, after which we'll have our main message. It's a recorded audio by Mr. Daly, titled, What is Worship? So, In Thy Loving Kindness, Yah, on page 41, then our main message by James Daly, What is Worship?
Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, a bit of background on this paper. Um, it's a, our modern English is using a word uh, worship in a bit of a, a generic fashion, which it, it uh, reads in scripture that it may not have been understood quite the way we're using it today. So I just, uh, this was quite an extensive paper, you know, a long time ago. And I sort of read a portion of it, I don't know if anybody remembers, about five years ago. So I took out a lot of the references and a lot of the material because it was, just seemed to be adding to the difficulty of, of perhaps understanding the, the couple of principles that really are at the heart of this matter. So the, the paper is, uh, is cut down a fair bit. And we can get everybody's uh, input when it's done. Uh, because I made quite a few you don't, you don't modifications to it from like a, five years ago. So let's cover what is worship. And worship is an old English word used in translation uh, when directed to the Almighty, Yehovah, to Yeshua, Jesus Christus, and the church. Now, for the past 15 years, we have made every effort to make plain who, when, and how we are to correctly worship and serve our Creator, Yehovah. The translations in this have not been overly helpful, but uh, I think you'll see, this isn't a very long paper, uh, all, of, all of your acceptable service, which is a, a different word than is used in the variety of translations for worship, uh, exhibits your correct worship. You know, your, your service actually is your worship. So, uh, but this is a, a generic term. And, you know, when, when you act on what you believe, that accurately reflects and exhibits your faith. And when, you, well, we'll see what conclusions people come to with this then as they go. So Deuteronomy 8, 19 it shall come about uh, if you ever forget Jehovah, your God, and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. So you can see there's two words being used right off the top here. I testify against you today that you will surely perish. So we will all die if we follow, serve, or worship false gods. Uh, are we all sure we know what worship means? and what service is, and how to correctly worship the one true God. So Micah uh, 6, verses uh, 6 to 8. And what shall I come to, and with what shall I come to Yehovah and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, holocausts, uh, with yearling calves? Does Yehovah take delight in thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, for my life? He has told you, O man, what is good. What does Yehovah require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. And uh, mostly it's the New American Standard Version is being used, except we're noted. Now, in all of our dealings, we must be fair, kind, control our pride, uh, while keeping all the terms of the covenant, all of it, minus the sacrificial component. So God desires and is to receive our genuine worship. John 4, verses uh, 23 and 24, the hour is coming, now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshiper. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So this word uh, worship means to declare worth to, uh, having worthiness or real worth. It's an old English term, West Saxon, um, uh, the having the condition of being worthy or honor or renown uh, from the word worthy and sip. It, this, having a sense of reverence paid to a supernatural or div, supernatural or divine being is first recorded around 1300. 
Uh, the original sense is preserved in the title Worshipful. The verb is recorded uh, around 1200, and I got that from online Entomological Dictionary 2010 from Douglas Harper. Now we see that above that the, the worship comes from old English words, uh, worship, worth uh, meaning worth, and ship meaning really it means more like a quality. And from modern English words like friendship, we can see that ship or ship being added to added to the, the word worthy means being a, a good friend or a quality friend or friendship. Now, this is also an homage rendered to God which is sinful, like idolatry, to render to any created being. References in the Easton's 1897 Bible Dictionary are, are Exodus 34, 14, Isaiah 2, 8. Now, such worship was refused by Peter in Acts 10, verses 24 and 25 and 26, and by an angel, Revelation 22, 8 and 9. I don't recall if that was uh, Gabriel or, or Michael, maybe. Now, worship is a term, or, or, or a modern term, that is loaded with misunderstanding. But we can see it very clearly, Matthew 4, uh, verses 8 to 10, Again, the devil took him, Jesus Christ, to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. He said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Jehovah, your God, and serve him only or alone. And typically, Christ quote scriptures, not too extensively, to make his point. So Satan here was offering Jesus Christ all of the political world order if he would, uh, th that Satan presently controlled, if he would worship him. Jesus responded by saying, you shall worship Yehovah, your Elohim, alone. I think I was quoting from Deuteronomy 6.13. But another reference here is Luke 4, 4-7. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall not live on bread alone, and he, uh, Satan, led him up, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, uh, you shall worship Yehovah, your Elohim, your God, and serve him only or alone. So Yehovah is identified as, as he who created all and to whom we give all the glory in how we live our lives. You see the paper, the purpose of life. Revelation 14, 7, And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him the glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, Jesus Christ did not permit himself to be worshipped as creator. You can see uh, Christ is not your creator of the paper. And neither do the faithful angels, but only Satan wishes for this. Now, Revelation 19, verses 9 and 10. And, and he said to me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said, These are the true words of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, Do not do that, for I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Joshua 23, 6 and 7, Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, so that you may not turn aside from it to the right or to the left, in order that you may not associate with those nations these which remain among you or make mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. And that's a reference to that as 1 Kings 9, 6. So just in these few scriptures off the top here, you can see that there's only one God who is to be worshipped. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Listen, Israel, Yehovah, your Elohim, is your Elohim. Yehovah is one, one alone. 
echad, that word. It's a very important word that gets, gets used here. It doesn't mean one team or, or one uh, you know, country or one anything. It's one being alone. Now, verse 13, you shall fear only Yehovah, your God. You shall work with him, wor worship him, and swear by his name. Now, we can read it in the Septuagint. Septuagint's important because when it was prepared about 200 before the Common Era, or B.C., uh, there was no contest with this Greek rendering or translation of ancient Hebrew. None. There, just, there was no the 70 linguists and scholars that were summoned by Pharaoh to put it together. Now, there was no complaints about it until the, the first century, near the end of the first century, because people wanted to uh, change it from from somebody being born of a virgin to being born of a young girl and that type of thing. But there was no, there was no mention of it at the time of Christ. So the, the Septuagint was a Greek version, Koine Greek, and was held in high esteem. It's quoted in the New Testament. Nobody said there was something wrong with it. So if you hear any problems with it, you can just keep that in mind. But you can see the words here are that you, you cleave to him. So, uh, swearing is important. It's generally because of our, our translations that you're sort of told you're not allowed to swear, but you can read how to swear properly and for some references to that. So we're continuing on, Revelation 22, 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. So you could take from that that you know, sort of bowing down to the faithful host was forbidden because it was seen as worship. And anciently, when, when armed warriors entered the presence of a king, you know, they would lay themselves on the ground, spread their, out their arms, so they were completely at the mercy of the king. They couldn't defend themselves. And they would speak whatever they had their, you know, their coming before the king, the reason they had come there, but, but they could not raise themselves in a way that they could defend themselves until they were granted permission by the king. And yet, here we have now the synagogue of Satan worships at the feet of the saints or the church of God. So, you can think about this one, Revelation 3, 8 to 11, I know your deeds, behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word, you, you, we have kept the terms of the covenant, and have not denied my name, Yehovah. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and bow down. The King James has worship. I will make them to come and worship at your feet, you saints, to know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour uh, which is about to come on the whole earth to test it, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have in order that no one takes your crown. So I mean, this, this one hour of testing on the whole earth it may be coming if we have our, uh, our understanding of, of the... Uh, Jubilee cycle, correct. You know, the 15 years, this last hour of difficulty on the earth could be from 2012 to 2027. It may not be correct, which is something to perhaps keep in mind. In any event, there's one hour, which is 15 years. And now, this, uh, this really, though, is talking about the acknowledgement by the individuals here who are part of this group who thought they were the, you know, going to be the leaders in the world to come are gnashing their teeth when they find themselves in the second resurrection and it's probably not where they wanted to be because they're not on top of everything where they may well be now and who realize their error but in any event it sort of indicates that, that these these individuals will be forced to, to bow or to worship at the feet of these saints now, recently, during the Days of Unleavened Bread, we had Ambassador Newman as a guest speaker. And when the request was made for God's blessing on the meal, it was made, uh, he did not bow his head at all. And when the prayer was concluded and he agreed with the wording, he said, uh, so be it. 
So, you know, there's, the, we nod our heads in a, a simple acknowledgement all the time that, that you concur with what somebody else might be saying, and but we don't sort of accept that this bowing of our heads in a nod is, is somehow worship or bowing down to. You know, so it's... Um, You know, is, is the degree, you know, the amount you bow yourself. Some people bow very low when they're listening to a prayer or, or agreeing with the prayer. And, uh, and uh, other people just bow or tip their heads. So, I mean, this whole aspect of, of bowing to and worshiping is uh, just something to think about here. Because, you know, is it, is it how far you tip your head forward that it be, suddenly becomes worship? Or can you just nod your heads in simple agreement? You know, you may tip your head when you meet somebody. You know, most of us do that just as a matter of, of habit or acknowledgement. And, and when does a bowing become worship? I guess we all saw in the news when, when Barack Obama was, was bowing to the, the emperor of, um, of Japan. And he, he was bowed down almost to almost close to 90 degrees, which we could very close to conclude that that is heading towards what's being discussed here is worship. Or is it? Now, most English uh, use of words in the, in the translation of Hebrew and Greek words are often misleading and potentially confusing to those who do not understand how the older terms were used. Now, gay, of course, used to be mean lighthearted and happy. Or in the King James, it was uh, for wearing expressive and luxurious clothing, as you can see in James 2, 3. Today, it's uh, come to mean homosexual in the last, I don't know, perhaps 20, 30 years maybe. And, but the, the curse of the languages, the curse from Babylon are still on us and with us. So I think we're all aware of that and be careful how we use words or get caught mis misusing words just to uh, make sure that our that our conversations with each other and our prayers before our Father in Heaven uh, reflect uh, and have a, a, a proper understanding that's scripturally based, not based on what society may or may not be using words at this time. So um, we need to study and be cautious with the words we use as it is by these we will all be judged. Matthew 12, 37, for, for by your words you shall be judged and by your words you shall be condemned or given a, a corrective judgment. Ephesians 5, 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. So a pretty, pretty strong statement here. So Hebrew words that are translated worship are shakah, um, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, seventy-eight twelve, to hold in awe, to revere, uh, to humbly beseech, to stoop, to bow down, to do obeisance and to prostrate in homage. So this prostration of laying yourself on the ground, self on the ground, puts you at the absolute mercy of the individuals you're prostrating to. Homage is, is given by many of the uh, servants in the British Commonwealth nations who, who take an oath of homage to the queen. So is that worship? Uh, Shakok uh, continues on here, bowing down. Um, to depress, bow down, prostrate before superior in homage, also uh, before God in worship, before false gods, and before angels. So it's, it's used in many ways. Uh, 99 times in the authorized version, there's an appendix at the back of this paper with about four or five pages. And I think I didn't, I don't think I missed any, so you can refer to everywhere worship is used in the King James. Uh, if you're when you're reviewing this a bit later, it's just something to think about. So, Atzab, uh, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, 6087, to hurt, pain, grieve, displeasure, vex, rest. So, that doesn't sound much like bowing down to, but it's also has a carrying meaning of to shape, fashion, make, form, stretch into shape, worship. So, th this uh, forming or, or carving or copying. Of manufacturing their own little little uh, gods, which uh, you know when uh, Israel was leaving 
leaving the land he was in with the, you know, the daughters. One of the daughters took one of the household gods that had been manufactured or made, uh, which you can conclude is, is not unreasonable exactly to say uh, shape and fashioning of making gods or false gods uh, to the thinking of the day. But uh, if we continue on, the Hebrew words that are translated uh, uh, serve, because when we started out here, you saw we're talking about worship and serve. Worship and serve. You might conclude they're talking about two radically different things, but we'll, we'll just see if that's correct. So, abad, uh, to work, serve, labor. Uh, to work for another, to serve by labor. To serve as subjects, to serve God. To serve with the Levitical service. Uh, be worked, till to the land. Make yourself a servant and to compel to labor or work, to cause to serve. So you can see it, it has, uh, is basically talking about a, whether it's a forced service or a service that is willingly um, provided. H Hebrew and the way ancient Hebrew was put together has to fit in a certain way because of the numbering of, of, of the way Hebrew is put together, which is why it, it can't have been produced by any humans. You know, every 50th letter on the first two books, or you're uh, having Torah spelled. On the last two books, it's spelled backwards. And Levit Leviticus, every 50th letter spells out Yehovah, the name of, of the Creator. So sometimes the English and other translations seem a bit stilted in, in our modern tongues because they're trying to capture sometimes just by straight word use and the, and the flow or, or the translation sometimes doesn't work very well. So, but if you're reasonably familiar or can research the, the Hebrew and the Greek, you can usually work out the point that's being made if, if some of the translations seem to be a bit confusing to us. Now, Greek words translated worship are proskuneo, uh, Strong's Greek Dictionary, 4352, you know, similar to shakha, the, the Hebrew, it, ha it also has a meaning of, of to hold in law, to reverence or to revere, and only the Almighty may be revered or held in reverence, which is why all these, these uh, Trinitarian groups that, that call themselves um, uh, Father or Reverend are, are sinning by the improper use of a, of a flattering title, which is forbidden, or prostrate in homage. So we have uh, from the word uh, kineo, to kiss, uh, to um, bow, bow down before, um, bowing down. And you can see how the, how the word is used, but it, it also has the meaning, though, of, of a, to, to put forth and to kiss the hand, a bit like dogs licking your hand in, in a way. But here you're talking about submission uh, to, to a, a higher authority. So uh, Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the Magi of the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him, to proskuneo him. In verse 11, And they came unto the house, saw the child with Miriam his mother. They fell down and worshipped him opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So even though the English term worship might lead you to believe they're, they're worshiping as, as the Almighty, there also was a, this idea of, of um, honoring him as a future king and with uh, kingly gifts of honor because a lot of these courts, you, you couldn't enter the king's presence unless you would provide him with a, with a, a gift basically an homage or an honor. But you see, anyway, I think we'll understand that they're, they're not worshiping him as a almighty who, who somehow could be born a human being and die. So Sibomai, uh, 4576, to worship, God-fearing, and also means uh, to, to adore or to revere. So Mark 7, 6, uh, he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they sabomai me, uh, teaching as doctrines the, the precepts of men. So, you know, 
Jesus Christ said, you're to keep my commandments and keep my instruct, not commandments as if they're in conflict with God Almighty's commandments, but his instructions as to how you are to spiritually apply and live according to the law of God. See, that's what they're talking about. So, so in vain are they, are they um, saboma-eyeing or, or adoring or revering potentially um, him in, because they respected uh, the words that he was using but also uh, him challenging the Pharisees of the day, pointing out their errors in worship, you know, he's pretty forceful the way he spoke to them. You can just imagine he's up in the temple of God, sort of like giving them the biscuit there. It'd be like going into the Vatican and just railing at the Pope and everybody around him there. So you can imagine the effect some of this is happening, but... but uh, you just have to make sure you're clear on the on the context of these, because you, you just see this worship. I think it was used 99 times. So another Greek word for worship is epinoing. I didn't get a reference for that in the face of, or in the presence of, or in sight of. So the worship means to bow down to, to obey, be in obeisance to, humbly beseech. It's a generic English term that similar to God. We must understand the, the scriptural context like the term God can refer to Satan. Because you may remember, you know, 15 years ago when there was such a challenge on this aspect that, that Jesus Christ wasn't the God Almighty, and people would quote the scriptures, of course, with him being called a God and say, well, no, it says right here. Well, it, it also says something else in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, the icon of God. He's not God. But he's, he's, a, he's a photocopy. Well, that's bad wording there. But, I mean, it, the point is, yes, the, Satan is called God in the English rendering here. Jesus Christ is termed God as well. It doesn't make them the one true God, and the confounding comes from the English generic use and that we don't use names uh, properly. So that uh, was coming from Deuteronomy 6, uh, the whole verse there, 1 to 15, you need to read the whole thing. Uh, but you can see we're using the same English word for uses, but, but it often has a different meanings in the Greek or the Hebrew in different usages, and we have to be sure we're clear on that. So Matthew 8, 2, there came a leper and proskuneoed him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So this is a King James who came and worshipped him. A leper came and worshipped him. So Matthew 8, 2, in the New American Standard, Behold, a leper came to him, bowed down to him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So that whether it's bowing down to, in, or, or humbly beseeching him, because he's speaking to him, he said, well, you, you know, I'm beseeching you, if you would be willing, Messiah, uh, you can make me clean. And yet here we, in, in the King James, it, it said worshiping him. So you can see that this uh, reference for humbly beseeched instead of uh, bowing to, Matthew 9, verse 18, he spoke these things unto them. Behold, there came a certain ruler, worshiped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come, lay your hand on her, and she will live. King James. So in the American Standard, while he was saying these things, behold, there came a synagogue official, bowed down before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come, lay your hand upon her, and she will live. So you'd have to understand that this is related to the, the humbly beseeching. He's making a request of someone who has the authority to... to uh, cause people to be brought back to life who are dead. So, Matthew 15, 25, there came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me, King James. As she came, beginning to bow down to, to, before him, saying, Lord, help me. So, instead of bowing down to, if it had a re reference, humbly beseech, it may have been a, a little more clear. So the, the context of the verse below is to hold in awe or to be astonished at. Matthew 14, 32 and 33, And they got into the boat, the wind stopped. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. 
So those in the boats uh, were in awe of him or were astonished that he could command the forces of nature and they obeyed him. Worship doesn't quite fit the bill, at least in the, this modern English understanding or use of the term. Translations like seen above cause many people to believe that Jesus Christ is God, where Jesus Christ never directed any worship to himself. John 4, uh, 19 to 24, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet, perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped at this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place men ought to worship. So this, this was a Samaritan woman. She's talking about Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans of Christ's day would, would have their sacrifices and that ta- all that was going on. They said it had to be done on Mount Gerizim. You people say that Jerusalem, Mount Zion, not Mount Gerizim, is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, an hour is now coming when neither on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, nor in Mount Zion, that you shall worship the Father, you shall wor- you worship, you Samaritans worship, that which you don't know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For of such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Everywhere on planet Earth, whatever time zone you're in, not just at Jerusalem or in a small area around the Middle East. So uh, we have to make sure that the context doesn't get confounded with some of these translations. So what are we left with here? Uh, Not that many references, but enough to make the point, I believe. Are are we to give worship and service? Or are we to or service? Or how how would we uh, conclude our responsibilities are? Is there a difference between worshiping Yehovah, our Elohim, and serving him? And in various passages in the Renewed Testament, the Greek word proskuneo describes worship in Jerusalem, even with Gentiles in attendance. And you see that in John 12, 20, Acts 8, 27, and chapter 24, 11. And for Jacob, you know, as a reference is in Hebrews eleven twenty one. You know, he leaned on the staff and worshipped. So it is also word uh, used for, for false worship as well, for, for worship to Moloch and Remphan, you know, the star of a god Remphan in Acts 7.43. And uh, most of us have a tendency to border on worshipping ourselves, you know, making ourselves greater and better than we actually are. So you can see that references from Revelation 9, 20, 13, verse 4, 8, and 12, and 15, and chapter 14, 9 to 11, chapter 16, verse 2, 19, verse 20, and 20, verse 4. So it's just a matter of false worship, and, and yet the term worship or proskuneo is used, but keep in mind that the context of the, of the scripture can put a slightly different lean to the wording and how we should really be thinking about it. Now, the Greek word lateo is generally used regarding temple service and duello uh, used for service, servicing mankind. Now, in some translations, uh, latreo has been translated as worship instead of serve. And you see that in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So here you've got it as service, and in other places you'll see it as worship. And you can see Latreia, uh, service rented for hire, uh, administration, so uh, administrative services, the services of God, the service and worship of God according to the requirements of the Levitical law, and the performance of, of sacred services. So it's got a bit of a bit of breadth to it, these words. And you can see that your, your correct service was categorized as worship. Hebrews 9, 6, when all these things have been prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing divine worship. So this was this is true under, under the old covenant, Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now Israel, 
what does Yehovah, your Elohim, uh, require from you but to fear Yehovah, your Elohim, walk in all his ways, love him, serve Yehovah, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, when you take the translation from the Septuagint, um, Deuteronomy tw uh, 10, 12, now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you, thee, but to fear Yehovah your Elohim and, and to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve Yehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So here you have um, the service and meaning what you're doing with your worship is what is a paramount with this. And the, wor the word serve in the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament, here we go, is letreo. Strong Greek Dictionary 5647. There's another reference there, Deuteronomy 11.13. Now, continuing, when, when Jesus, when people fell at the feet of Jesus, they humbly beseeched him. And references for that are Matthew 8.2, 9.18, 1433, 1525, chapter 20, verse 20, 28, 9, and verse 17. Also in Mark 5, 6, Luke 24, 52, and John 9, 38. So here's how uh, the term is being used here, latreo. But you can also see here in, in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 16, 4, and then the said the king to Ziba, Behold, uh, thine are all that pertained unto Bethshobeth. And, and Ziba said, I, hung, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, O Lord, O king. So here we have the, the Hebrew of, of doing obeisance or, or homage includes the feature of, of Beseeching, because you're coming before the king usually because you want something, you're making a request, or you're explaining something, and humbly beseeching may well be a better English rendering of a, of a lot of these places in Scripture, not all of them, but just to, just more to keep this in mind as you're studying. And so it, it means that neither men, uh, Acts ten twenty five, nor angels, Revelation nineteen ten, uh, twenty two eight and nine may be worshipped in the way modern people use the term. And yet, for the same word is used for the uh, synagogue of Satan coming before uh, the saints. Now, those saints are resurrected at that time, so it may well be that they'd be in a different category, but they still can't be talking about worship, or proskuneoing, the way you do with God Almighty. So... Under the new covenant, God's temple is the center of worship. Its sacrifices are presently being measured. Revelation 11, 1. Now, there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Revelation 4, 6. I saw another angel flying in mid-heavens, um, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, and he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him the glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So it seems fairly clear that this, uh, this term, worship, is principally directed at God Almighty, but it can be used for, for people or angels or Jesus Christ and, and humbly beseeching or asking him to bring your, your dead daughter back to life or, or s s s staying the, the winds when you're out in the water and about to get drowned and sunk and he commands the, the, the winds and they just subside. So um, you, you, you're being humbly beseeched to save these people's lives. So this, this gift of prophecy in the early church could help convict an unbeliever and cause him to worship the one true God, though. 1 Corinthians 14 uh, verses 24 and 25 but if all all the saints prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters he is convicted by all he is called to account by all the secrets of his heart are disclosed and so falling on his face he will worship God and declare that God really is among you 
So in the first century here, there was a there was this uh, this cultural uh, phenomenon, but this, this culture that allowed people to fall on their face, and, and uh, we generally don't do things like that today, and we we may not even bow in submission as we ought to, and simply just nod our heads. And so I just want to cover this because. Uh, about five years ago, we you know, spent a couple of Sabbaths on this and the original paper. We took out all of the uh, references and, and other things that just didn't seem necessary to make the point we wanted to make with this. But um, we'll just cover with a, a we'll close with a few more here. So, Revelation 4 8 to 11, the four living creatures, each one having six wings, full of eyes all around and within. Day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is Yehovah Elohim, the Almighty, who was, who is, is to come. When the living creatures gave thanks to honor, glory and honor, to thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, uh, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, will worship him who lives forever and ever. That's Aeonian and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you did create all things because of your will they existed. So you can see who they're directing uh, their, their uh, worship to. So, But in other places, the authority can be human or God's authority. In Revelation 5, 9 to 14, they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the book, open the seals, you are slain, and have redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. You have made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I beheld, I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the voice and the Beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and uh, thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessings. And every uh, creature that is in heaven and on earth, under the sea, such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power. Be unto him that sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever, Aeonian. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four twenty elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. That's from the King James. So you can see that the, the worship to an eternal creator who has life inherent is being addressed here, who, who created all things. Now, we'll just uh, read that in another uh, version here. Revelation 5, 9 to 14 again. After these things I looked, beheld from a great multitude, uh, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and thrones, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, all the angels that were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living beings, they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. So here we have a, more than just bowing down to, but total and complete submission and prostration. Saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So Revelation... Um, 11, verse 15 to 18. The seventh angel sounded. Those there arose loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, of his Christ. He will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We will give you thanks, O Jehovah Elohim, who is almighty. So we're talking about the one true God here who art and wast, because you have taken your great power and has begun to reign. All the nations become enraged. The wrath has come. The time came for the dead to be judged. 
and the time to give their reward to the bond servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, great and small, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. So we have, it may well be, we're going to, at the feast, we can all start laying flat out on the floor and, and uh, considering if that is, is or isn't worship, or is that just making a show of worship? But here you can see it's treated very seriously. These are, these are people uh, of the spirit world. You know, these are, these are the faithful hosts of God Almighty who are, have their own dimensional life forms, you know, different dimensional aspect than we have, but they're still sitting on thrones and coming before God Almighty and prostrating themselves before him. And they don't seem to be alarmed of doing that, trying to exhibit their faithfulness, perhaps. Now, we sing the song of Moses and the Lamb regularly at the feast is commanded. Revelation 3, 3 and 4, they sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Yehovah, God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, you King of the nations, who will not fear, O Yehovah, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, and your righteous acts have been revealed. So all the human nations, as well as all the faithful hosts, will worship before the Almighty. So what is worship? There are some problems with the English word in translation. The Greek and the Hebrew terms, I think you could see from the few references here, do not mean exactly the same thing, but are closely related. You know, the Hebrew abada and the Greek latreia um, usually, but not always, translated worship. These are not the only words translated worship, and these words are not always translated worship. So that's uh, not exactly confidence building, but we're all meat eaters, and just should be aware of some of these features so we don't get sort of caught in quoting a scripture that, that may need an explanation to it. So in some circumstances, bowing or acknowledging was not accepted, and you can see in Revelation 22, 9. But in other cases, it will be required, as you saw in Revelation 3, 9. So is there something with the context of that or, or in the, the understanding of this bowing down to or bowing at your feet, meaning that these people will understand the, the seriousness of the errors that they brought upon uh, planet Earth and the, and the temple at the time of Christ and other difficulties so that they will be in submission to the saints in the first resurrection, which does not necessarily mean to our thinking of, of the way worship is granted to God Almighty. So in, in some circumstances, the, the angels would not allow this uh, acknowledging or this bowing down to, and in other cases, is, is seemingly required. So uh, Philip. Philippians 2.17, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share with, with you all. So you can see that the New Testament saints are, are sacrifices and service, requiring of services. Now, these sacrifices, you know, Jesus Christ fulfilled every last uh, sacrificial offering in the Old Testament. But, you know, the peace offering, every trespass offering, every offering he fulfilled. But these saints here are, are also being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial, spiritual sacrificial system and the worship or, and the service that they are doing under this astonishing persecution. We've been relieved of some of it in the last couple hundred years because of the blessings that were provided to Abraham. So we've been fairly free of what, what these saints went through of for the previous 1800 years just absolutely persecuted and driven into the mountains and burnt alive I mean just terrible so it's such a, a horrible offense for people to believe that somehow 144,000 members of a of a very late blooming corporate entity are somehow going to be in the first resurrection as if all these faithful uh, drink offerings that are being poured out throughout the past 1800 years aren't you know, be, you know, some of the fewest of us will be there because of our, because of the, what we've been, the benefits we've had instead of appreciating it properly. 
you take advantage to a greater degree. And anyway, just keep that in mind. So Romans 12, 1 to 2, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I don't know if that clears anything up, but your spiritual service of worship is, is to live your life in a way that you can be categorized as a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we don't need to make a show of our prayers or our good deeds when it's done as a display of our presumed self-righteousness. You see that in Mark 12, 12, 40. Of the uh, mostly of the condemnation of the Pharisees and the way they put their money in the in the in the bowls and made sure everybody saw what they were doing and you see this exact same thing going on throughout the world today, or you know making a, a show of prayers that, that sort of are a mini sermon in their own right uh, that don't don't need to be make a show of them. It just needs to be a, a, a direct request and thanksgiving and praise to our God Almighty. You know, because you could have part of our job is to give thanks and praise to God as well. This is part of the service. So we're fulfilling most of the terms you can find here and the requirements of the saints of the Most High. You know, we're, we're not far off. And, and uh, so we can, anyway, let people make their comments when we're done here. So we might uh, reasonably conclude that our correct service to the commission of the gospel of the kingdom of God going to the whole world as a witness it is actually acceptable worship. So, you know, people taking care of websites or doing this, that, and the other are performing an acceptable sacrifice and are an acceptable sacrifice by the service that they're doing and providing. Because uh, talk is cheap. Anybody can rattle along all day. It's what you do with what you can get and know. So, but all of us are regularly, you know, are perhaps occasionally, humbly beseeching our God Almighty for the assistance that we need to fulfill the terms of the covenant so that we're not found wanting, as we just were reading, and that we can be uh, found to be acceptable. So we'll close with that, and uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, that's a... Uh that's an interesting study because obviously, uh, you know, the majority of uh, what we want to call Christianity puts Christ on the same plane, the same level and equal with God. Um, and most of them elevate the Holy Spirit to that same level when, you know, that was and that was not the case. Uh, you know, there was some movements in the Christian church back in the uh, 300s AD. And in 325, the Council of Nicaea, this whole subject of the divinity and equality of Christ with God came up. And that's when it was formally documented that Christ was equal with God and the Trinitarian doctrine really became formalized. So you know, it's interesting or good for us to know, important for us to know, uh, so that we don't get confused uh, what these words mean and what these these uh, these behaviors actually are. So, very good study. Thank again, James, for that. Um, if you will all take up your hymnals and rise, we will... And I say rise, what I mean is stand up. I'm not, you know, calling anyone to resurrection or anything like that. So lest I offend anyone, I hope <laughs> nobody's offended by that term. But if you'll please stand up and uh, open your hymnals to page 48. Uh, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 60 titled Return Again, O Yah, after which I'd like to call upon... Uh, Mr. James Daly to close in prayer, if that's okay. So page 48, return again, O oh Yah.
Okay, if you'll remain standing for the closing prayer, we'll turn the mic over to Mr. James Daly. James? James, uh, nothing's coming through. We can't hear you. Ah, okay. Well, I'll go ahead and close in prayer then, if you all bow your heads. Almighty Yehovah, we come before you on this fourth day of your Feast of Unleavened Bread to give you great thanks again, Father, for calling us out of this world to understand your plan of salvation. Father, we're thankful for the fact that we can worship together during these days, during this feast, these days of sanctification, understanding, Father, that we've been redeemed, we've been rescued from the death penalty, which we've brought upon ourselves through our sinful behavior. And for that, Father, we are extremely regretful. We understand that every time we violate one of your smallest principles, Father, and commit a sin, that we bring upon ourselves that death penalty and cause the blood of Christ to be shed in a sense, because that's why he gave himself up as a sacrifice so that we might be cleansed of our sins and receive the gift of salvation. A gift, Father, that you give to us freely and that you give to us because you love us and you are a merciful and loving God. So, Father, we're thankful for the fact that we can be here to worship you in spirit. Thankful for the fact, Father, that coming out of these days we are renewed um, through the, the washing of our sins and that we can carry on through this next year, Father, and work on the things that we know we need to work on and overcome our faults. Father, as this world continues to spiral down into calamity, we pray that you would give us steadfast faith and strength through your spirit, Father, to endure what we must and to realize that even though we are going to go through some terrible times and this tribulation will not be easy, that through it all, you will not leave us or forsake us, even to our physical death, and that we will, if we remain faithful, if we follow you and we obey you and keep your laws and keep your sacred calendar, and do the things that you tell us to do, that we will receive that gift of salvation and we will not lose our crown. So, Father, we're ever thankful for that. We're thankful for the fact that we have brethren around the world that we can keep this feast with, even though we may not be physically able to be together. Father, we are bound by the Spirit that is working within us, your Holy Spirit. And we're thankful, Father, that we can do that. So, Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We ask for your blessing upon the afternoon meals that we will be partaking of. And we again, Father, just ask for your dismissal, thanking you with all humility. Father, in the name of Yahushua, our high priest and elder brother, we pray. Amen.